All right, so today we're going to talk about economics, and the tragedy of the commons, and things like that. So first of all, let's talk about environmental science versus environmentalism. There's a difference. Environmental science is a pursuit of knowledge about the natural world. Scientists try to remain objective. It's a difficult thing, but scientists always try to not pick one side or the other to just see where the facts lead. Um, it's a goal of science. So environmental science is the pursuit of knowledge about the natural world. Environmentalism is a social movement dedicated to protecting the natural world. A lot of times it uses science, sometimes it doesn't. It's, uh, like I said, it's an environmental move. It's a social movement. So it's a very different thing. So what started environmentalism? Well, in 1952, the Cuyahoga River in Ohio caught fire due to all the pollution that it accumulated on it. So there's so many things in the water and so many flammable things floating on the top. Somebody threw a cigarette butt or something and happened to ignite it and the river caught fire. So you can imagine how much nasty things had to be in the water for that to happen. Something else about 10 years later, Rachel Carson published a book in 1962 entitled Silent Spring. This was about the effects of pesticides on large predatory birds, particularly the bald eagle. So what people started noticing about this time was a lot of the large predatory birds were, their numbers were decreasing. The bald eagle became an endangered species, so did the peregrine falcon and the brown pelican. Well, we'll talk about this more later, but there's something called biomagnification with certain chemicals that don't break down quickly in the environment. DDT was this wonderful pesticide. It was, uh, it worked really, really well. And you just had to spray something once and insects that got on it would die for a long time. Well, what ends up happening is imagine you spray grasshoppers for, with DDT. And they, before they die, they jump into the water and they get eaten by a fish. So that fish eats two grasshoppers. Well, now that fish has twice as many pesticides as the grasshoppers did because it ate two grasshoppers. Well, now a bigger fish comes by and eats three of those smaller fish. Each of those smaller fish had eaten two of the grasshoppers. So you can see where I'm going here. Now that one bigger fish has six grasshoppers worth of DDT. You go along through this and it increases rapidly. And you get a bigger fish that eats a medium-sized fish and then finally the bald eagle eats the, several of the bigger fish and it's getting a lot of DDT. So what happens with birds specifically is if they have enough DDT in their system, when a mother bird lays eggs, the shell is soft. And so when she sits on them, they break. So you suddenly had all of these large predatory top of the food chain birds that weren't able to hatch any babies. And it doesn't take long for that to happen before you start losing your birds. Here's a quick example with the brown pelicans. My family was a bird, were bird watchers when I was growing up. My wife and I are still bird watchers. Um, but we got real excited when I was growing up when we saw a brown pelican. It was very rare to see one and it was exciting. When I started college, there, you would see one or two a year and we'd get really excited about seeing it, or I would anyway. By the time I graduated, and my wife and I lived in Galveston for a couple of years after that, um, by, the end of the by the time we moved from Galveston, there were brown pelicans everywhere. You could see them all the time. And it was because it took that long for the DDT to get out of the system. So it was the mid to late 80s, or early 90s, I'm sorry, early 90s before the brown pelicans started recovering their populations. Anyway, that's what Silent Spring was about. This began a public awakening to the threats of pollution and toxic chemicals to humans as well as to other species. And the movement is called modern environmentalism. There's Rachel Carson with her book. So 
One thing about environmentalism that has changed is because we have increased travel and increased communication, we know what's going on all around the world as soon as it happens. Things that wouldn't affect very many people or people wouldn't care about because they did, it was happened far away, they wouldn't know about it. The Deepwater Horizons oil spill in 2010, people were watching that oil pumping out of the ground live all over the world. And whereas if before the global uh, communication happened, maybe only a couple of people in the Gulf of Mexico would know about it because they were fishing and they got into the oil or some oil started washing ashore. Now the whole world knew about it. So this damage that was happening to the environment, everybody knows about. Global environmentalism explores issues and problems over the entire world not just within the local community. So let's talk about the tragedy of the commons. You should be fairly familiar with it because of the two assignments we've done recently. So a great deal of progress has been made since the birth of modern environmentalism. We hardly ever have rivers catching on fire in the United States, but there's many debates still going on. An ecologist named Garrett Hardin wrote an essay called The Tragedy of the Commons in 1968, describing the source of environmental problems as a conflict between the short-term interests of individuals and the long-term interests of civilization and the earth itself. And just to put this in perspective, this was written a year before I was born. So let's talk about what exactly this means. The classic example is a village that consists mostly of farmers. They raise and sell sheep at a nearby city. The only place for the sheep to graze is a commons in the center of the village. A commons is a central is an area that belongs to no individual. It's shared by the entire society. So what Hardin says was the likely outcome was the villagers would obtain as many sheep as possible and allow them to graze in the commons to maximize short-term financial gain. The problem is this can only support a certain number of sheep, and if you get too many in there, they eat all the grass, and then it can't support any sheep. And the, th the idea is if I don't do it, someone else will. So if I don't put an extra sheep in there, one of my neighbors will. The result is that the commons is overgrazed and will eventually support no sheep. I didn't do them, then somebody, else, someone else would. This is a uh, quote from the old cartoon of the Lorax, which we'll watch in a couple of days. Please think about it, won't you? Every once in a while, I sit down with myself asking, Onceler, why are you a onceler? And I cringe, I don't smile as I sit there on trial asking, Aren't you ashamed, you old onceler? You ought to be locked in a who's cow, you should. The things that you do are completely ungood. Yeah? But if I didn't do them, then someone else would. That's a very good point, Mr. Wessler. Progress is progress, and progress must grow. So, the idea that Garrett Hardin said was if the common was instead divided into sections that was owned by each villager. Because the land is owned, individuals are much more likely to plan and use it for the long term. So think about if this, if each little square can only support three sheep. If you put two sheep on there, your sheep are going to be healthier. There's going to be more grass. And like I said, you'll have bigger, healthier sheep. If you have three sheep, you'll still have grass. Everything will be fine. If you put four sheep, there's going to be less grass. 
and your sheep won't be as healthy. And over time, you're not going to be able to support any sheep because they'll have eaten all the grass. So this describes the likeliness of commons areas being exploited for short-term economic gain. Examples include the atmosphere and the oceans. So if you pollute the air, the pollution doesn't just stay there on top of you. It spreads all over a large area. And so the pollution in your spot is less like bad because it's spread around other people. Fishing. If um, you want to catch fish in the ocean and you know there's a bunch of fishermen out there, if you don't catch too many fish, you know the neighbor over there is likely to. And so everybody just catches as many as they can and the fish stocks get depleted. So let's talk about Garrett Hardin. You should have seen some of this by now. Many of ideas are now being stepped back a little bit because most common areas in his example are well taken care of. So, and you think about it, if you've got a commons area and the town knows that it can only support so many sheep and one of your neighbors suddenly puts twice as many sheep onto the commons area, you think they're just going to sit there and let them do that? No, they're going to do something about it. And most commons areas are actually well taken care of. Hardin actually had many problematic ideas. Here's some of his quotes. In a welfare state, how shall we deal with the family, the religion, the race, or the class, or indeed any distinguishable and cohesive group that adopts overbreeding as a policy to secure its own aggrandizement? To couple the concept of freedom to breed with the belief that everyone born has an equal right to the commons is to lock the world into a tragic course of action. Here's another one. It seems to me that if there are to be differences in individual inheritance, legal possession should be perfectly correlated with biological inheritance, that those who are biologically more fit to be the custodians of property and power should legally inherit more. So instead of your inheritance coming from how hard your parents worked or what they had inherited before them, it should be on who is more biologically fit. Um, some of these ideas that he has are called eugenics. And this was pretty popular before World War II. Hitler loved it. And it's kind of got a bad name after that. But this was the idea that only those people with good qualities should be allowed to breed. And people that were um, defective in one reason or another. And it could be as simple as not as strong as somebody else or any number of things. Those people shouldn't be allowed to have children. And only the people that were fit, the people that had good genes, should be allowed to breed. The only way we can preserve and nurture other and more precious freedoms is by relinquishing the freedom to breed, and that very soon. So his idea was that the freedom to breed was not something we could do and that it should be turned over to governments and only, whoever, only the people that the government decided had good genes should be allowed to breed and have children. So it wouldn't be up to you to decide how many children you wanted to have or whether you wanted to have children. The government would tell you. These quotes were in the same article that was where he wrote about the tragedy of the commons. Here's one of his other ideas. This is in different writings. My position is that this idea of a multi-ethnic society is a disaster. That's why we've what we've got in Central Europe and in Central Africa. A multi-ethnic society is insanity. I think we should restrict immigration for that reason. He was one of 52 academic researchers who signed an, a paper called Mainstream Science on Intelligence, published in the Wall Street Journal in 1994. Turns out this Mainstream Science on Intelligence wasn't exactly mainstream science. Only 10 of the people who signed it were actually intelligence researchers, and a lot of intelligence researchers did not agree with it. And here's some of the thing, one of the things they had to say. Sev several of their 25 conclusions were pretty bad. This is one of the worst. Members of all racial ethnic groups can be found at every IQ level. The bell curves for some groups, Jews and Asians, and East Asians, are centered somewhat higher than for whites in general. Other groups, Blacks and Hispanics, are centered somewhat lower than non-Hispanic whites. So 
So he had many problematic ideals. Now, the thing we have to remember, and this is something that a lot of people have forgotten or don't agree with at the time, at this particular time. Oh, sorry, I'm jumping the gun. He was on the board of directors of Social Contract Press, which publishes white nationalist literature. So what I was getting at before, just because he had a lot of bad ideas and beliefs doesn't mean all of his ideas were wrong, but it does mean we should maybe look at his motivation. So what people have forgotten about just in the last couple of years or don't agree with is the fact that people that are really not very nice have a lot of beliefs that we abhor. That doesn't mean everything they did was terrible. Um, just because this guy, Garrett Hardin, has a lot of bad ideas doesn't mean all of his ideas were bad. The tragedy of the commons does have applications in a lot of places, but we do need to look at the motivation behind it. And that's something we'll be talking about a lot about is when we read something, what was the background of, what, of, the, of the author? What were they trying to get across? So let's talk about Eleanor Ostrom. She was the first woman to win a Nobel Prize in economics. She researched and found that many people maintained their common areas on their own without top-down government rules. People using a commons area will often self-govern with rules and punishments for those that break the rules. So if you're putting too many sheep in the commons area, it might be something as simple as your social standing will drop. People will look down on you and say, you're being selfish and things like that. If it gets more egregious, maybe they'll come to a point where they say, okay, you can't put any sheep on the commons next year because you put too many this year. Things like that, those are just examples. Commons areas are often self-governed well and taken care of. Okay, and that's where we're going to stop for today. Um, we'll continue more about economics after in the following lectures. So have a good day and stay safe.